we're trying to do with public health policy is create freedoms for all members of society. And the way we do keep a functioning healthy community is by bringing in place regulations or rules that make it work for everyone together. The recent surge in COVID-19 hospitalizations and deaths has led to calls from medical experts for the government to immediately implement its plan B. But how dangerous is the situation? And how likely is another winter lockdown? To discuss these questions and others, I'm delighted to be joined by Devi Sridhar, Professor at Global, of Global Public Health at Edinburgh University and author of the forthcoming Preventable, The Politics of Pandemics and How to Stop the Next One. Devi, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So to start, how bad do you think the situation is at the moment? So I think we're having a mixed picture. On the positive side, we know we have really effective vaccines. We know the booster program is getting rolled out now. And finally, the teenage um, vaccination program. Um, we know we have new treatments. And so scientifically, we're in a much better place than we were last winter. But on the flip side, the NHS is quite stretched right now. We know that staff are quite exhausted, burned out, and there's not much mo- room to maneuver. And I think that's a precarious situation to go into winter with, which is not just due to COVID, but COVID, of course, is just adding pressure on top of everything else. And there have obviously been calls to move to plan B, so that's uh, mandatory masks, working from home where possible, and vaccine passports. Do you think these are measures the government should have introduced all along? Yes, we have to always look internationally. And I think when at every stage of the pandemic, what I try to do is look at countries and say which countries are doing well in terms of public health, but also their economic and social policies. And right now, the places to be looking at, I think, are Norway, um, Germany, New York City, even Italy, France, and saying, well, they're countries that are quite similar to us. Um, and how are they managing to keep their numbers at somehow a lower rate than ours, their deaths much lower, and heading into winter, making sure their health services are running. And so we are out of sync. Um, In Scotland, we still have mandatory masks, but I guess in England, with not having mandatory masks, it's a small, minimal thing to do that doesn't seem that intrusive, especially in shops and public transport. Also, we're out of sync in terms of vaccine or testing certification, meaning if you're going into indoor venues, making sure that you either show you're fully vaccinated or you've had a negative test result. Um, in Germany, you have to show in the past 24 hours, in New York City, the past seven days. Again, not stopping risk completely, but lowering the risk, um, as well as continuing that rollout of vaccinations to hopefully get to a rate like Portugal. I mean, 98% in Portugal is pretty remarkable. Um, we seem to be kind of stalling. And so how do we get those numbers higher, especially in younger age groups? And what do you think has been driving the rise in cases? Is it an inevitable consequence of having... Uh, almost no restrictions? Is it fading immunity? Yeah, so it's probably a complex picture. I mean, the the largest one, I mean, we're back to normal and we're having mass events going ahead. You're having nightclubs open and there's not many mitigations in those places in terms of making sure people are either negative tested or fully vaccinated. Um, So of course, more mixing, that leads to more cases. And we know with Delta, unfortunately, you can still test positive after and be infectious, even if you've been fully vaccinated. That's the new gift that Delta brought us compared to the wild type. And so it's a more challenging picture. And I think while cases are, of course, important, it's also looking at what's happening in hospitals. And right now, what's happening in hospitals is is pretty um, shocking, I think. Talk to anyone in the NHS. And I think that's the worry, which is if cases go up, even if we've weakened the link with hospitalizations, there's still a link. And that just keeps adding pressure on top of a very overburdened service. And one of the mantras we've heard throughout the pandemic is that we must not allow the NHS to be overwhelmed. Do you think it is already overwhelmed? I think if you talk to people working in the NHS, it is at basically at capacity. They're already having to do triage to decide when, when there's limited capacity, who's going to get those beds and the staffing, staffing being the biggest issue. And so there's not much room going into winter to have COVID pressures on top of that. And we don't want the NHS to become a COVID health service like it had to do in the past. It should remain an NHS for all health issues and all patients. And what's your response to those who say that while it's undesirable uh, for COVID cases to rise, uh, we simply can't afford uh, to introduce Plan B? There was a, a leaked government document uh, which put the economic cost at 18 billion for five months. 
Yeah, so I'd say, I mean, the first thing that when I read that document, it was largely the working from home element, which they estimated that. If we look at other elements of Plan B, and the ones that I think are also really important are first, the uh, mask wearing. I don't think there's any economic cost associated. I mean, if we look at France, Germany, New York City, other places with asking people to wear masks on shops and public tra- and shops and public transport. And the other element is vaccine certification, which I actually see as protection. If you go to a cafe in Germany and you want to sit inside, you need to show that you either have um, been fully vaccinated or you've had a negative test in the past 24, hour, past 24 hours. In New York City, it's a negative test in the past week or full vaccination. And these businesses are staying open, able to trade, able to have people working there feel safe, not off because they've got COVID, um, but that's because they've put in place these measures. So I think we have to look carefully instead of saying like all a plan B, look within it and say, what are the measures that can be introduced that protect public health, but also keep businesses being able to trade and stay open. Um, And even with kind of working from home saying, okay, well, what are the industries where it is going to have a cost and how can we use vaccinations and testing and masks to make workplaces safer? Do you think the government's, the UK government has been far too complacent over COVID? I mean, I think you only have to look at the report that came out from Jeremy Hunt and Steve Baker, who are both um, conservative MPs, which looked at the response to COVID to say that actually, yes, I mean, there has been a sense that if we wish the pandemic away, it will go away. If we think there's no COVID, there will be no COVID instead of acknowledging the severity of the issue. And I think if we go back to the start, I do wonder if people would have rather had a more blunt, straightforward assessment, which is what you know scientists could see from March 2020, from February 2020, which is this is going to be a chronic issue that's going to go on for several years. How are we going to manage this? These are the kind of steps that we could look for, vaccines, testing, treatments, rather than the idea that you know this is going to be over by the summer, this will be over by Christmas, this will be over. I think in a sense that gives false assurance and instead people want to hear Bluntly, what is happening? What is ahead? Of course, we're in a better position now, but we're not out of the woods yet. Yes. Do you think there was a full sense of mission accomplished at the time of the so-called Freedom Day? Yeah, I mean, I think the name itself is quite strange. I've chose freedom because in a way, you know, freedoms are also kind of protections. Like, for example, we don't let people get drunk and drink as much as they want and drive. Um, You could say it's their freedom to do that, but it impinges on other people's freedom to drive on the roads and be safe. Um, we don't let people drink, uh, smoke indoors um, and blow their smoke on other people because we say that impinges on the freedom of people to go into cafe and not have to breathe dirty air from secondhand smoke. So in a way, I think what we're trying to do with public health policy is create freedoms for all members of society. And the way we do keep a functioning, healthy community is by bringing in place regulations or rules that make it work for everyone together. Um, And it's not just in health. I mean, you can't be angry at your neighbor and go and shoot him. And that's fine. That's your freedom to express your anger. I mean, there are protections in place. And I so I hope slowly we'll move from this talk of kind of restrictions on freedom to protections to have a healthy society. And that's kind of the transition to now living with COVID. Do you think the UK risks another lockdown if plan B is not introduced now? I mean, nobody wants another lockdown. I think it'd be absolutely devastating for social and economic reasons. Um, And hopefully we can avoid one, we have the tools, but the lockdown happens when the NHS is basically collapsing. It means you have ambulances outside hospitals, people can't get unloaded and they can't get into care. So people die who otherwise wouldn't die because they can't see a doctor or a nurse or a medical professional. That's the essence of why countries have locked down, including Sweden, though I know people point to Sweden. Sweden did actually pass emergency legislation last winter because of that exact issue. And so the question then is, how do you keep the pressure off the NHS? You're never in a position where you have to say to people, you know, you're not going to get care if you need it. And so could it get that bad this winter? I think potentially there's not much room already. We see ambulances outside hospitals and staffing being a major issue. But I hope we would be smart enough to avoid a lockdown by using other tools that we have, minimal restrictions, minimal protections and settings to say, okay, we want to keep sectors open. We want to keep nightclubs open. We want to keep bars open. How do we do it in a way that makes it safer and lowers the risk of transmission? What are the steps we can put in place now minimally to avoid a more harsh response later? And when people say that plan B would be bad for the economy, do you think this ignores the fact that COVID itself is not good for the economy, that a surge in cases means more people having to isolate, it hits consumer confidence, and obviously it runs the risk of more severe measures 
being imposed down the line, such as something closer to a, to a full lockdown, which would it obviously be devastating for growth. I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think, you know, the puzzle for all countries since the start of, you know, when this first emerged was how do you keep your economy and your society running while you suppress COVID? And South Korea figured that out by doing mass testing and tracing, though, of course, Delta made it more difficult. New Zealand made their choice to say we're going to bubble ourselves off from the world, sacrifice international trade and tourism for keeping the domestic economy afloat. Um, Every country kind of tried to choose their way through this crisis. Luckily, vaccines came along and testing and treatments, and they can do a lot of the heavy lifting. But I think the idea that if you have, you know, COVID cases completely don't matter anymore is a false one, because while we've weakened the link, you know, initially out of Wuhan, the estimates were that 20% of patients would need hospitalization, a third of those ICU. You can imagine why countries like Mali shut their borders immediately, because they were like, we can't even cope with the fraction of that and on our on our health service. Um, you know, then then we looked in Britain that with advanced testing and catching asymptomatics, the rate came down to 10 to 12 percent. And now with vaccines, it's probably down to about two to three percent. And what that means is, of course, our curves between cases and waves of hospitalization get luckily not looking the same. It gets smaller, but it's not gone away. And I think that's why we have to keep looking at cases and that kind of pressure on, on health services. And I think businesses get it. I mean, I do talk to businesses and they reach out to me. To, to explain the issue. And they're very acutely aware of what consumers want about their workplace, having safe workplaces. They've been some of the fastest look at the United States to put in place vaccine mandates to say to their employees, you need to be vaccinated if you want to work here. You've seen many businesses bring in daily lateral flows, especially in you know cafes and restaurants and bars to say, we want, don't want to have a workplace where we have transmission happening. So I think we have to give credit to businesses to saying they want to stay open, but they want to stay open safely, but they're looking for guidance. As a public health expert, how do you feel when you see pictures of the House of Commons with rows and rows of maskless MPs in very um, confined surroundings, uh, seemingly contradicting the government's own guidance on masks? Well, and it's also, I think, what is it they recently said that anyone else coming into there has to wear a mask, except if you're an, an, an MP. I mean, I think you have to lead by example and you have to lead from the front. And it reminds me, sadly, of what was happening in the United States under Trump, where masks became politicized. And if you wore a mask, you'd have to wear it all the time, outdoors, indoors, everywhere to show that you're a Democrat. And if you're a Republican, you never wore a mask, no matter where you went, which is really tragic because in the end, I mean, given the analogy, it's like sunscreen. I mean, if you're out in a place where you might get burned, you wear sunscreen because you don't want to get burned. Maybe masks are different because different you can infect, you know, it helps protect others. So it's more, you could say like secondhand smoke. But I mean, I think it's it's really tragic to have it politicized in this way and masks being seen as um, virtue signaling, as some have said, rather than as a way that actually some of us want to protect ourselves and protect those around us. And it's an act of goodwill. It's an act of kindness. Um, and luckily, I think in Scotland, you know, mass coverage is really high, I would say about 90 to 95% is my sense. Um, even, you know, they've done using, using kind of looking at train stations, it's about 80 to 90% of coverage. But it is kind of farcical that people will wear a mask to the Scottish border and then take it off when they go into England, and then vice versa, get to the Scottish border and they put on your mask. It'd be easier if we just had consistency. And I, and I don't, I don't understand the aversion to, to masks, why it makes people so angry. Um, but it does. I don't understand it. Same with the vaccines, though. I mean, nobody's forcing vaccines onto people, but it seems to still make people very angry if you talk about vaccines. We've talked about the rise in COVID cases since Freedom Day, but there was some interesting modelling from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which suggested that COVID cases could fall as low as 5,000 a day uh, this winter. What's your view of that? I mean, it could, right? There's a range of scenarios. And the hope would be, if we didn't have Delta, I would be incredibly optimistic because we could see that Delta could stop transmission and that if we could vaccinate to, what was it, 60, 70%, we would be having what we might call some kind of population immunity, which meant the virus couldn't find carriers to transmit to others. We had blockers. And that's how we dealt with things like measles, mumps, rubella, um, you know, also eradicating polio, um, um, almost um, smallpox. But I think with Delta, the challenge became, well, uh oh, we can't just vaccinate and hope it blocks because people can still get infected and transmit and test positive. And so it kind of means we need to shift away um, from just purely a focus on case numbers to also looking what those case numbers translate into. But it doesn't mean we can disregard them completely. So, yeah, I'd say that's where we're at. How much of a challenge do you think uh, public fatigue is? Because perhaps understandably, people feel as if they've been living with COVID 
for almost two years. And it's something they'd, in many cases, simply rather not think about now. Well, same here. That's my view every morning. There's like 10 seconds where I think, you know, there's no COVID. And then obviously it's, it's, it, it, it predominates. I would say just think about others. I mean, think about the people working in hospitals. That's exactly how they feel. Think about the people, the nursing staff in ICU units, you know, the doctors, you know, the people who have been at the front line dealing with this. So we're all tired of it, but they're especially tired of it. And if there are little things we can do to make their life easier, then we should be doing them to help them. And we all know people who work in the NHS, whether it's friends, family, colleagues. Um, and so it's kind of things, what can we do to help them out this winter? And that's the way I try to see it, which is, yes, we're all tired, but we're also in a much better position. I mean, things are largely open. And so how do we keep them open with minimal public policy interventions um, to keep things on track rather than completely you know, pretend like it's not there and a problem at all? It is a problem. It's how we manage it. And finally, I mentioned uh, your new book, uh, which is due to be published in, in May, um, Preventable, the Politics and Pandemics and How to Stop the Next One. What should uh, the UK government and others be doing now to prepare for the next pandemic? Yes, I think that the two big things now to be looking at, um, well, obviously we have to learn from our mistakes. And I think the report was the first one. But I think, how do we move from identifying a pathogen to developing a vaccine and getting it into arms within 100 days? So the 100 day challenge is something I've been involved with. I think also, what do we do in those 100 days to keep compliance? Because, you know, prior to this um, pandemic, um, you know, we always looked at things like, what if MERS goes, goes, you know, goes global, it kills a third of people, young people, um, it's another coronavirus. Um, and, and my view is like, oh, well, everyone will just comply because people will be scared and they're going to listen to government and say, let's eliminate this and we can manage it. And I think my worry now is given the level of misinformation, will there be protests against MERS where a third of those people die because they're out protesting and they all get infected? Will there be you know, groups that call it a conspiracy? Will there be people who refuse to get vaccinated because they say, that's my worry now, that actually some of the rationality has just gone out the window with the rise of um, platforms, which uh, such as Facebook, which have clear wrong information that is influencing, you know, thousands, if not millions of people around the world and their choices. So I think that's the other big one. It's like we can, of course, do this, this work scientifically to develop a vaccine. We can do the work in public policy to develop how we manage those 100 days and kind of what are the, the, the you know, how businesses function, how societies, communities function. But what do we do if, you know, there's in a sense, create, this misinformation creates anarchy and actually trying to develop a plan and go towards a direction. And that, I think, is the probably the biggest challenge facing right now. Um, public health is that misinformation and how wide it has spread. Thank you very much for joining us, Debbie. It's been a fascinating conversation as ever. And for more on COVID-19 and the challenges the UK and others face, subscribe to the New Statesman in print and online today.